Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by MD Advantage Insurance Company, Newark Board of Education, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the Northward Center, TD Bank, PSEG Foundation, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, and by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working for a healthier, more equitable New Jersey. Promotional support provided by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. And by New Jersey Globe. We're now joined by Dr. Glenn Marie Matthews, Director of Complex Family Planning at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Doctor, great to see you. Thank you for having me. Doctor, I met you on a podcast we did recently talking about a whole range of issues, but largely around reproductive rights. Since the decision by the Supreme Court on June 24th, 2022, the so-called Dobbs decision, that allowed the states to make decisions about reproductive rights, reversing Roe v. Wade, if you will. The greatest impact, particularly for women of color in underserved communities, is? I mean, that we continue to be marginalized, that we continue to be the, the less than and the people that are impacted most by decisions that are made by people that are not within our healthcare system, that have no understanding of what our patients need. Okay, talk to me about the doctor-patient relationship and how it's impacted. So it continues to impact a relationship that was already disfranchised, um, where we struggle with, especially our um, Black community, to show the trust that is needed, right? So by impacting this, patients sometimes feel like they can't tell you the full story um, already before this decision, and they continue to feel that way. They are scared about what that impact will have on them if they've traveled from a different state, what it means for them when they return to that state, really what it means for them in general. Are they going to be imprisoned? Like, People don't know what it means for New Jersey, right? So they just watch the news. They see all the things that are happening throughout the different states, and they're not sure if this is not happening in Jersey. And so when they call, they're even afraid to say exactly what they w need their appointments for. So it's just making already mar um, impacted um, relationship even more impacted, honestly. Talk to us also about, it's an interesting issue because uh, you are part of a larger healthcare system, RWJ Barnabas Health, a major supporter of public broadcasting, supporter of what we do. I, I happen to know there's an anti-racism initiative that's very real within the organization. How is this situation in any way connected to uh, that anti-fighting racism initiative? I think it just um, broadens what we stand for more. Um, it really helps us to fight um, and really gives us a stance. It shows us that uh, it shows that Barnabas and um, Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson, we're here for a patient. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're coming from. We are really here for you. And the, the organization in general has really taken on DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion as a big thing. And even within our department, within the OBGYN, we have formed um, committees really looking at how we can better inform our doctors, get us to be um, trained in implicit bias, which is a bias that you might have that you're not aware of. So we've been taking really large steps to make sure that we are providing the best care for our patients possible. I mean, Doctor, we don't get a chance to ask this question enough. Your passion for your work comes from where? 
Um, from a small island. I'm an island girl. I came from an island of Jamaica. Um, and really, that started when I was 10, when my cousin got pregnant as a teenager. And abortion is legally restricted there. And she had no way of getting an abortion. She was kicked out of the house. It really impacted her future and her projection of who she is. And really, at the age of 10, I said, well, I'm going to stand up for women just like this. Um, and I need to make sure that everyone has access to whatever they need. And so that's where my passion is fueled for. And my patients every day continue to refuel that passion. Um, whenever I encounter someone that is not able to get access, it drives me even more to get them the access to care that they need. This is a health equity issue, is it not? It's a major health equity issue and continues to, to show the impact. COVID only um, skimmed the, uh, the surface of really what's going on in this country. And this is really enlightening people because I feel like sometimes the general public is not aware of what's happening behind closed hospital doors. And this um, Dobbs is really opening the eyes of um, people in general. Even if you're not a female, you have a wife, you have a sister that might be impacted by something that complicates their life and pregnancy right now might not be the right time. So that people understand this, each state, doctor, has its own laws. And that's what this Dobbs decision said, that each state can have their own laws. New Jersey has its own law, quote unquote, codifying Roe versus Wade. Texas has a different law. Alabama has a different law. California has a different law. What about if someone said, you know what? States' rights. Is it different in your view when that comes to healthcare, particularly in underserved communities? Yes, it's different in healthcare. Why is that different in healthcare? Because really, if you are privileged, you can afford it. You can travel wherever you want to travel right. to get from healthcare. If you're in a state and you do not have the privilege of financial resources, you don't have someone to watch your child for you while you travel 30 miles to go see this doctor and get an ultrasound, then travel another 30 miles the next day to get your procedure, then this is really impacting your life, your family life. So having different states implement different um different rules and regulation. And in, in, in fact, some of these states are states already that are um, low numbered OBGYN. For example, in Georgia, there is limited number of OBGYN. So we're really talking about something here that's really bigger than state to state. Final question from my end. Because people who can move around to other states uh, in terms of reproductive rights are doing that, to what degree have you seen your patient load or the patient load of your colleagues increase here in New Jersey? Um, I definitely, New Jersey has definitely been having an increase in patient loads. I've seen people, I've seen patients that have traveled as far as from um, states such as Louisiana. So people are traveling very far to get the care that they need. Um, more abortions are happening. The good news is that in Jersey, we are making change and the governor has been so gracious to really listen to the voice of the people and make changes that are impacting our states in positive ways. So we are beefing up our workforce, um, allowing mid-level such as midwives and nurse practitioner to be able to provide abortion care. We're trying to get them the training they need in order to really beef up our workforce. So we're working hard on this. Um, and New Jersey Jersey is seeing an increased number and will continue to see an increased number, but we are ready. We are ready to help the people in New Jersey and the people um, in other states, wherever they're coming from, we're here for them. Dr. Glenn Marie Matthews, we greatly appreciate your time, your uh, commitment to the patients you serve every day, and, and thank you so much. Wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. You got, I'm Steve Adubato. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Do you know someone who's done something extraordinary for others, whether a community service or an act of heroism? That person may be a candidate for the Raspberry Award for making a difference. Help us pay it forward by honoring New Jersey's unsung heroes in their efforts to make a difference in the lives of others.
Most people don't think about where their water comes from, but we do. Veolia, more than water, resourcing the world. Hi, my name is Alma Saracia at Malcolm X Bass High School in Newark. I completed the FAFSA because it's a graduation requirement and to assist me with paying my college tuition. Last year, Newark students earned more than $77 million in scholarships and financial aid. Don't miss out. See your school counselor today. Let's go to work, class of 2023. Complete the FAFSA or NJAFAA. We're now joined by our longtime friend, Doug Doyle. News and Sports Director at WBGO 88.3. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Steve. Always great to be with you. You're, you're, a, Jersey, you're a Jersey guy. WBGO are longtime media partners, public media based in New York. But you, you get this Pittsburgh thing. What's up with that? Well, um, I was raised in an outskirt town of Pittsburgh called Delmont, Pennsylvania, where my family still lives. So, yes, indeed, I am a Steelers, Pirates, and Penguins fan throughout. No matter what I cover, they're still close to my heart. We appreciate that. And uh, Doug, do us a favor. We'll talk about news coverage in just a second. Talk about the sports programming you do, which is not just about, as you and I like to say, X's and O's. It's about sports and culture and society and much more. Go ahead. Plug that. Yeah. Sports Jam uh, just received uh, just this week, Steve, best podcast by the New Jersey Society of Professional Journalists. And I don't think it's because of it's a sports show because it's a show about people and what makes them tick, right? So when I have guests like Trinity Rodman and we have guests like Bernie Williams, they, they're not just talking about sports. They're, you know, as you mentioned, the X and O's of the game, they're talking about family, what makes it important to them. And we get to issues that really are for anyone to enjoy. You don't have to be a sports fan to enjoy sports jam. Mm. Talk about the role of WBGO, not just the great jazz and the culturally significant programming there around the arts. Jazz is the premier jazz station in this region, in this nation. Talk about the news side of the equation, the role that WBGO plays. Well, I found out early on as I go on to my 25th year at WBGO in the news department that people crave information. You know, jazz fans, blues fans, rhythm and blues, whatever you enjoy, you also want to know what's going on in the world. So we try to give you a nice mix. Yeah, music is number one, but you need to be informed in order to make the right decisions, whether it be at the polls like we did recently, or whether it be, you know, when you're having a conversation with someone. Some of the most fascinating conversations that I have with jazz fans are about regular issues about mom and pop and family. And that's what people connect with WBGO, I hope. And they get that information from our newscasts or public affairs programs. As, as well as the podcast. Yeah, and also I want to make it clear that some of our programming actually airs on WBGO. Check that programming out. You look at their website, our website. But, but Doug, let's do this. You and I have also had conversations as the graphic goes up for Democracy at a Crossroads, a series we've been doing for years. The role of public media, I've talked to Neil Shapiro about this, our president at WNET Group, um, Joe Lee, the, the leader or the general manager over at NJPBS and others, Public media, I'm obsessed with our role in a democracy. How do you see it as some in major public positions in the federal government and other places have called us, quote, the enemy of the people? And not just well, public I, media, I, but all media, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely unfair. It's you're getting in depth coverage when you're talking about public media programs like the one you have right here. We're talking about the real issues that matter. You're not getting the cookie cutter that you might get on the commercial side. You're getting a, a chance to get as many different sides to the story as possible. We don't have to rush through when we do features about whether it be uh, you know something that's happening in Newark or elsewhere. We get a chance to get everybody weighing in on it, right? It's not just one quick comment and you're out. Yeah, sometimes newscasts can be that way, but with our public affairs show, we try to get in depth with the story. And that's what public media is all about, is trying to give you enough information for you to be informed to make the decisions you need to and not be brainwashed by various networks. You know, as you say that, Doug, uh, you've heard me say this before, people who watch our programming know I say this, we don't have a horse in the race. And people go, well, what does that mean? 
well, do you lean this way? Do you lean that way? I'm like, and I think, do you, is that what it is that we have to lean? We don't lean in any direction other than having respectful, civil, substantive, impactful conversation. People, oh yeah, right. And I know you believe, I know I'm, I'll get off my soapbox, but I know you believe the same thing. You have no horse in the race. We like horse racing, but we have no horse in the race. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, but you know, but we have to understand that this country is so divided now. So if you want to have ratings, if you're a commercial network, you want to have ratings, you're going to have to probably lean one way or the other, because if you're down the middle, you might not attract the viewers that you want to attract. You've got to have passionate people. And I think that's why we've seen, you know, on both sides of the aisle, we've seen just really biased reporting from all over the place. In public media, we have to do a better job ourselves of making sure that we present the whole story. And then we have to convince people that, yeah, this is the place you need to tune into so you get all the facts. Then you can make the decision because that's what's important, Steve, is that you, the viewer, make the decision based on the information, not you based on what somebody else is feeding you. You know what's so interesting about that? And I'll get off it. If, if the same act, the same action by a government official is done by one person that your media organization leans toward because they're of a party or a, a, a place in this political spectrum that you agree with, then it's, then it's okay. If someone on, quote, the other side, quote, unquote, the other side does the exact same thing, they're the worst person in the world. They're horrible. They're corrupt. You need to investigate. And I'm thinking to myself, can't people see through that? that that is not only bias reporting, but dangerous reporting. I said I get off my soapbox, I'm not. Well, I, I think that, I think that, you know, when you talk about whether people see through it, I, people see what they wanna see. People wanna connect with something, right? And all it takes is a few things happen in your personal life, okay. not to go well, and then suddenly somebody has to be for, to blame for it, right? You have to find, if someone's in office or they've yet to be in office, somebody's got to blame for your hardships, not just you, right? It's got to be the people who are running the country. So I think that that's why people lean one way or the other. But I'll be honest with you. I enjoy watching a news conference with a political official and flipping to all the different channels oh. to see how they spin it, because it's so different. It's like an indifferent world. Including election coverage is spun different. I'm like... Aren't those the results? Can't we just agree on? Some? Never mind. Okay. Hey, Doug. I'm sorry. That's what happens when you and I. This is the, these are the conversations Doug Doyle and I have offline as well. Hey, WBGO Jazz Media Workshop. What is it? Because we're very concerned about education as well. Go ahead. Uh, it's a great program, a uh, grant-funded program. Uh, Steve Williams, our uh, CEO and president, wanted to give people the same opportunity that he had when he was younger. Give them a chance to learn about the business, and so. I came in and said, you know, Steve, let me take over this program. We'll teach them how to produce their own podcast. And we got everybody involved in the station at all different levels. And we taught four students how to put together podcasts. And because they were all part of Jazz House Kids in Montclair, great organization. they wanted to do them. Yeah, great organization. And they wanted to do a, a music idea podcast. And each of them did a fantastic job. If I can give just shout outs to Emily Springer, Alvaro Caravaca, Brendan Mejia and Becca Deal, they did a fabulous job of taking their own experiences and making their own separate podcasts, whether it be mentoring, whether it be how to deal with uh, a disability when, when you're an, a musician, uh, what is Latin jazz? And for Beckett, drumming, how he learned to be a drummer, drummer you find out from his early days, and, and they all interview people in the podcast. We're quite proud of what they do. You can find it at wbgo.org slash studios. Yeah, that's important stuff. And let me also disclose this, that WBGO is a media partner of ours, and Doug's been working with us in the developmental stages of a sports and society and leadership a centric uh, podcast. Uh, he not only understands broadcasting and sports, but why it isn't simply the X's and O's. Um, my good friend, our good friend in the media, and, and also check out the Steve Williams interview on steveautobato.org. We did an interview with Steve a while back. Cannot thank you enough, enough to, to you and the family at WBGO and public radio overall. We thank you for the work you do. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate the opportunity, Steve. Good luck to you.
You guys stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Do you know someone who's done something extraordinary for others, whether a community service or an act of heroism? That person may be a candidate for the Raspberry Award for making a difference. Help us pay it forward by honoring New Jersey's unsung heroes in their efforts to make a difference in the lives of others. Most people don't think about where their water comes from, but we do. Veolia, more than water, resourcing the world. Hi, my name is Alma Saracia at Malcolm X Bass High School in Newark. I completed the FAFSA because it's a graduation requirement and to assist me with paying my college tuition. Last year, Newark students earned more than $77 million in scholarships and financial aid. Don't miss out. See your school counselor today. Let's go to work, class of 2023. Complete the FAFSA or NJAFAA. We are once again joined by Catherine Wilson, President and CEO, United Way of Greater Newark. Catherine, great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We'll have the website up for uh, the United Way. Tell everyone what it is and the important work you do. So, you know, United Way exists to disrupt the cycle of poverty in the greater Newark area. And we do that through the social determinants of health, health, education, financial stability. And we also do that through volunteerism and advocacy as well. Well said. We are very interested in youth leadership. We had a longstanding stand, deliver communication and leadership program led by our leader, Mary Gamba, but also. On your end, you your team created the Young Professionals Network. What is that? The Young Professionals Network is actually a group of, that's what it is, young professionals who have joined to come together to support United Way. So first things first, they come and we ask them to donate to the organization. They come to events and they also do service projects um, on behalf of the community. And the whole point of that is to get them to not just volunteer in the community, but also build a pipeline of volunteer potential board members for United Way and future donors as well. Talk about some of the most significant challenges that young professionals have in the workplace today. Uh, you know, March 2023, we're three years into this pandemic. Talk about that. Uh, I think that one of the challenges that we're facing as leaders and organizations is that we're seeing our teams become and continue to be socially isolated. Some of us continue to work from home, even in the hybrid situations, um, they're still isolated. And remember, you have a whole crop of young professionals who graduated from college during the pandemic who now are entering the workforce and they've never gone to an office five days a week, right? And so building those social connections with each other is really, really important. But Catherine, let me, let me try this. We have a young marketing professional on our team, mid-20s. She likes working from home. She likes working remotely. But I do wonder about the connection, if you will. Is it good enough? Even if someone says they want to or would rather work remotely, is it good enough in terms of human connection in the workplace for young professionals? I don't know that it is. And I think that's in part why we thought it was so important to create this young professionals network so that young professionals could network with each other and then network with professionals who have been in their field or in different fields for a while, because it's really important that they continue to have that social connection, in addition to building workplace skills, right? So practicing public speaking, practicing group projects, practicing being on time somewhere. I mean, those things are the soft skills that we look for in our workforce, and we want them to be able to come together and continue to practice those skills. But for the United Way, I mean, everyone grew up the United Way, give money, you see the you know, numbers go up. Yeah, but who, someone might say, is that really the work of a not-for-profit like the United Way, you say? I think the work of United Way is to continue to build leadership in the community 
And doing that with a young professionals network by teaching them that giving back to the community is important, whether that's through a donation, a volunteer project, community service, leadership on a board. I think all of those things are relevant in today's world. It's especially important in urban communities facing a whole range of complex challenges that think about the communities you serve right now. Leadership in urban communities, particularly among younger people, talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we look for young people to pour into, right? So that they are the next generation of nonprofit leaders, that they are the next generation of, of donors to support the good work that happens in the community. And a lot of times we also have young people who are the beneficiaries of services with organizations like United Way. And so they wanna grow up, they become young professionals and they wanna give back. And so I think it's really important that we provide those opportunities to young people in urban communities that they may not otherwise get. Be more specific about volunteering initiatives. What are we opportunities slash initiatives? What exactly are we talking about, Catherine? So, for example, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to take all the young professionals to build a bear. They're they're going to participate in that, you know, building the bear, right? And then they're actually going to choose the charity to donate those bears to for the holidays, so that kids who live in shelters, whether it be domestic violence or homeless shelters, have an opportunity to, you know, have a gift at Christmas. But this is taking them from the actual choosing the project doing the actual service and then donation um, to completion. And so that's an important part of the volunteering piece. Yes, we're taping this right before Thanksgiving 2022. We'll be seen a little bit later, but I'm going to follow up on this. One of the things about the United Way that always struck me and is important we put on the table now, particularly as we're talking about young professionals and leadership, particularly in urban, especially in urban communities. Do, do you think especially in these difficult, challenging times, Catherine, that it's important to teach people the importance of, quote unquote, making a difference. I, giving back sounds like a cliche, but that's what it is, making a difference in your own community. I think or is that, that just so organic and natural, everybody gets that, because I don't see it that way. Some people think that giving charity is just writing a check to United Way or donating to the community food bank through the grocery store, right? But giving back is different. Giving back is you're showing up in a place and a space where there is a need, whether that's volunteering with the United Way, volunteering at the community food bank, serving as a mentor for big brothers, big sisters, that's giving back. That's taking your time, your talent, and using your own skills, soft skills and otherwise, and leadership skills, right, to pour into the next generation, to sort of help build out that sort of fabric that we've lost, which is this ability to connect with each other and see each other as human beings. Hey, Catherine, I, I cannot thank you and your colleagues at the United Way for everything you do behind the scenes that people may not be aware of, uh, particularly for those who are dealing with especially challenging situations in our urban communities. Catherine Wilson joins us once again, the president and chief executive officer, United Way of Greater Newark. All the best, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll see you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by MD Advantage Insurance Company, Newark Board of Education, PSE&G, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the North Ward Center, TD Bank, PSEG Foundation, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, and by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by ROINJ and by New Jersey Globe. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Do you know someone who's done something extraordinary for others, whether a community service or an act of heroism? That person may be a candidate for the Raspberry Award for making a difference. Help us pay it forward by honoring New Jersey's unsung heroes in their efforts to make a difference in the lives of others. Most people don't think about where their water comes from, but we do. Veolia, more than water, 
resourcing the world.